or excuse me, Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for naught? There was no question that Job was faithful. What Satan was curious about was he only faithful because God had been so good to him. So he said in verse 10, Hast thou made a hedge about him and about his house? Everybody say his house. And about all that he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he'll curse you to your face. The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. But here's what I want you to see. I want you to notice that even Lucifer himself noted that Job's house was blessed and that God had a hedge around about him which means that even the spiritual warfare was limited and Satan was frustrated because he did not feel that he had an open channel challenging so here's what I want to do we finished all the anniversary stuff and as we begin this new season I'm going to be in a season of reestablishing and reaffirming a lot of basic principles doctrines and things like that over the next weeks to come and tonight on Wednesday night Bible study I want to start uh, a new series that I'm going to call living in a house called blessed now I don't even know where I'm all headed with this <laughs> Uh, But I'm being driven by burden. I have a burden because so many of our households are fussed up and marriages are having struggles and this and that. And I want to say from the outset, in my teaching tonight, I am not uh, issuing anything to any individual family or couple. I'm teaching to the whole body principles. If I got something to say to your individual family, I'll do it when we're in session. And uh, I don't know where we're going to go with all this. I want to talk about marriage. I want to talk about divorce. I want to talk about getting along. I want to talk about uh, kids. I I don't even know where all we're going to cover. Um, But I'm being driven of the Lord by burden. I want our homes to be blessed. Can you say amen? So lay your Bible down. And I'm asking you to lift up your hands unto the Lord and pray very fervently for a moment and ask God to help lead the teaching of his word. In the name of Jesus, Lord, thank you for your anointing. And I believe tonight, God, you have some things for us that will help us in our daily lives. And we ask you to bless our homes and help us have understanding to be blessed in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be seated in Jesus' name. I want to, I want to, when I say a house called bless, I'm, I'm wanting to take it from the broader standpoint. The Bible speaks of family as the household. Um, it didn't mean just the physical house. But it would include that. For example, the Bible talks about the house of David. Or the house of Saul. Or the house of whoever. Uh, We understand that that's an inclusive kind of situation that's including the overall condition of a man's and a woman's life and family. Kind of the, the whole picture. Uh, And it can even include extended family, even when children are grown enough that they're married and beginning families on their own, and even though they're starting another level of household, 
you can be a part of your own household and still be a part of the extended bigger picture household. You follow what I'm saying tonight? So I'm talking about the uh, things that extend to marriage, to kids, grandkids, finances, the, the overall thing. We're going to talk about a little bit of it all over the weeks to come. Uh, I want to start with a premise that I think is one of the big ones that has to be busted out of people's minds right off the bat. Because if you don't get this premise correct, then you're going to come up with a bunch of wrong answers all along the path. And that's simply this. Being in a house called blessed does not mean that you're part of a perfect or flawless house. Three of you, amen that. That's you all going to be a tough crowd tonight. <laughs> every home, every marriage, every relationship has challenges that have to be overcome. And there are problems and stresses that are, some of them are just part of day-to-day -day life that everybody has to face. And then there are certain unique things that rise up due to unique circumstances. And they may be different from your neighbor. But they also have their unique circumstances that they have to deal with. And so blessed does not mean no drama. <laughs> because every household is going to have some drama. Now it shouldn't involve the police. <laughs> Shikamo <laughs> shy. That's, that's ridiculous. But every, every household is going to have drama. So it doesn't mean, blessed doesn't mean no drama, but what it does mean is managed drama. When drama arises, we've got to be able to manage it, and the more drama is well managed, the more blessed a house can become. Because, and again, what we read in Job in starting our premise text uh, is that I also want to note that being in a house called blessed does not mean an attack-free house. Job was utterly a blessed man. He was so blessed and his house was so blessed and his family was so blessed that the devil himself was complaining about it. And yet, even though he was so blessed, uh, he was still vulnerable to spiritual attack. I, I want you to understand that when Christian couples get married, we're going to have all the same issues that any other couple has to deal with. And then we're also going to have an added dimension of spiritual things that are going to sometimes war with us perhaps a little more so, but the good news is we also have some spiritual tools that have been given to us. Unfortunately, we don't tend to use them as much as we should. And everybody will have issues that are directly related to their spiritual walk. But again, we have weapons of our warfare, we have some things. God has not left us helpless. And, and that brings me to another premise I want to talk about. Is Job lived in a house called blessed, uh, and Job was a godly man. The Bible says he feared God, and he eschewed evil. And even Satan noticed the condition of his house. So because of its blessing, he decided that he wanted a season to be able to attack it. Because Satan was convinced that if he could have full reign for a little while, he can destroy that household. And he all but did. You know, I think sometimes as saints of God, we need a fresh understanding of just how much the devil hates you. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, the devil hates you. Don't say you hate him. Say the devil hates you. 
And when the devil hates something, he wants to attack it. And I want to tell every family in here, Lucifer wants to destroy our homes. He wants to destroy our marriages and all of our relationships any way that he can. But I want you to understand that the reason that he wants to is not really because he cares about your marriage. What he cares about and really what he hates and the reason that he hates the church is because God's in it. And the reason that he hates certain people is because they represent God. So here's the point. Satan hates anything that has a God order to it. So when Lucifer figures out that God attacks it, or God likes it, he'll attack it. Anything he perceives God has blessed, uh, anything that he believes God has ordered up or set into order, uh, he will come and deal with it. So as I said, he doesn't necessarily care about our marriage, but he attacks it because God cares about our marriage. He does not really care about how you dress and live, uh, but he attacks it because God is concerned about how we dress and live. I don't even think that Satan is all that interested or cares about our human sexuality. But he gets involved because he knows God cares about it. And anything that God ordered, Satan is going to work against. Even down to the simple premise when he created us, that he made them male and female. And so Satan fights that. Bring up Genesis chapter 2. We all know this verse, but therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, and the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Uh, they shall be one flesh. Everybody say one flesh. Mm -hmm. Marriage is the foundation of every generational household from a biblical sense and when I first got married I began my own level of household but I was still a part of the greater level of household as we all are so even as we build our own we're part of a larger one but eventually over time and due to the passing of generations and the aging of the uh, humans and uh, condition, generational death takes place. And eventually, even though I started out low on the rung, at some point, all of us end up having a turn at the patriarch or matriarch level, so to speak. And I want to remind the church that God invented family before he invented any other thing after creation itself. He invented family before he invented the church. As a matter of fact, family was the original great cell group. <laughs> it was the thing God designed to make sure that everyone has a place of provision, that someone is taking care of somebody uh, all the time. And that no one was left without anyone to care. That's why Lucifer loves to damage homes as much as he does. Uh, because he loves to destroy children's lives as best that he can. Because in doing so, he has a better shot at destroying their spirituality later. And that they may never even walk with God. And the health of families becomes the health of societies, kingdoms, and even the church. And traditional marriage, and we know it's amazing that you got to say this nowadays. I used to be able to say marriage is the foundation of societal fabric for thousands of years. Now you got to classify it. Traditional marriage, <laughs> meaning one man and one woman. That, that's, that's the, uh, anything else is not designed of God. That was what God ordered. That's why Lucifer is so behind all this other stuff uh, because he really doesn't care about the sexuality part of it. What he cares about is that anything God ordered, he wants to pervert. America, from a big picture standpoint, is probably the greatest kingdom 
that has been in the history of the earth. If you want to compare to Rome or this or that and the other, but none of them compared to the worldwide wealth and power that America has had in particularly the 20th century. But it is being systematically weakened at the family level. And this has been going on for decades. And it's amazing to give you an idea of just how strong the thing is. It has been under utter attack for decades. And still it's, it's standing, but it's, it's getting weaker. It's getting damaged. And two of the most successful nations are America and Israel. And it's interesting because they're run by similar patterns of government that are rooted in individual freedoms and rooted in and based on biblical concepts. No other kingdom had those things woven into their basic laws and concepts of thinking more so than these kingdoms. Maybe England at one time. Now flip that on the other side and you have kingdoms that are socialism, communism and so forth. Those are not godly principles. They are satanic in their, in their nature. Because what they promote is actually an unbiblical concept. Uh, it pushes individual responsibility to the side. And it takes the freedom of choice out of a man or a woman's hands uh, and demands conformity at the same level when it, by everyone. And then, of course, after a while, what we have seen historically over and over again is that then after everybody gets on the same level, then the entire level drops altogether. <laughs> and I remember just a few years ago, for example, in our modern news, people were touting Venezuela and how socialistic it is and how great it is in the economy and the oil and yada, 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 yada. <laughs> and anybody with half a brain would know it's not going to last because it was socialistic in nature. We didn't even have to wait that long. Things are in such chaos down there right now that our government's even wondering if we got to go get involved. Human suffering is incredible. To go. Folks, I'm here to tell you the, the lines of garbage that we're being fed by our modern media trying to push the beauty of socialism, it is nothing but a satanic idea that's trying to weaken one of the greatest economies in the history of the world. Not just the world, not the history of the world. It fails everywhere that it's tried. And yet, we keep thinking that somehow it's going to magically work different with us. Example of it, and, and, and there's a lot of discussion going on right now over our health care and so forth, and this is going to have a big impact on us. And there's a huge push in our nation to go to single-payer health, let the government take care of it. It would be the worst thing that we ever did in this nation. And the reason we know is because we can look to other nations that have done it and realize how many of them are trying to come to America to get service because they can't wait long enough. They're dying on the vine, waiting for service. And any of you that are, that are in the military have a little bit of taste of socialized medicine already. <laughs> and you see how ineffective it can be as far as speed goes. But there's a backup. The private sector's there in case. But in socialism, there is no backup. And so everything becomes dependent upon the one system, and then when the weight of all of that comes in and collapses, it just, it just bears down on it. Bring up the uh, slide. Uh, this picture is uh, Nikita Khrushchev. He was the Russian president back in 1960. It's kind of a famous uh, picture. He was speaking at the UN. And uh, some argue that this was not an exact direct quote, but it was certainly a, a, a paraphrased concept of Khrushchev's philosophy. He said, we cannot expect Americans to jump from capitalism to communism, but we can assist their elected leaders in giving Americans small doses of socialism until they suddenly awake to find themselves under communism. Now that is the plan. Now I don't blame the Russians for where we are. I blame the stupidity of our leaders. 
for the last number of decades, two or three decades. And, but I, the reason I'm bringing all this up is because this is exactly how Satan works. And this is exactly how he works in our marriages, in our homes, in our spiritual life. He knows he can't come and, 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 and take us from one extreme to the other. But he wants to walk us uh, bit by bit into spiritual coldness. Now, again, I don't blame the Russians for this. But since 1960, when this challenge was taken and they, they said, we will destroy you from within, you know, kind of deal, again... Uh, it, it's not them doing it, but it's the same spirit that drives their philosophies is the satanic philosophy. And that philosophy has been loosed here. Islam's being loosed here. There are all kinds of spirits that have dominated other cultures and nations throughout the 20th century, and it is now trying to destroy America. Now, I have faith, and I'm believing that God is somehow going to spare America from going to a complete fall of that in so much as the only reason I think that is because of the fact that it appears to me that America uh, according to scripture as best I can figure out is uh, one of our divine purposes is to be a protection for Israel in these last days and we're not able to do that if we're in a collapsed state uh, but we are certainly in a corrected state and we're in a an unhealthy state and we're not uh, you know so again I, I say that just to say I'm keeping my fingers crossed <laughs> and I'm praying that God will somehow spare this nation from the foolishness of our leaders for the past 30 years or so and give the nation some blessing that's come from leaders who thought a little more biblically in times gone by but that said where I'm going with this is this since 1960 when this picture was taken divorce has become rampant in America and the reason that it has is not because of the Russians it's because of a lack of Christian influence the church has been and I say church I'm not talking about the apostolic church I'm talking about just general historical Christianity general religiosity Churchianity is what I like to call it, is dying on the vine. And they have lost their impact. And they're, they're ordaining homosexuals and they're doing all kinds of foolishness that their forefathers would roll over in their graves if they knew what this modern bunch was doing. Now, I have a philosophy of it. I believe that all throughout the 20th century, the apostolic Acts 2 church was kind of on the sidelines and nobody was paying a whole lot of attention to what God was doing in it because everybody's attention was on the denominal churchianity world. But now, as we come into the 21st century, uh, the denominal churchianity world is so weak and anemic, uh, they can't even begin to handle the problems of this crazy day. Uh, but there's one group that has an answer. There's an apostolic altar that I still believe can handle uh, any crisis, any problem, anything, uh, because it's a direct link to the power uh, of God. And let the church say amen. Amen. I believe that God is setting the stage by lessening a lot of other voices. And in the last 10, 15 years since the turn of the century, I have marveled at how apostolic voices have been coming to the surface. Apostolic minister is the uh, chaplain of the UN. Brother Stone King speaks to the General Assembly. Um, some of you saw on the news just during the Houston floods and so forth, the president visited our United Pentecostal Church in Houston. That was one of the centers for it. They interviewed Brother Gurley, our superintendent of Texas, and it was on national news. Uh, you, you have to understand something. Back when I came into the church, uh, that idea was so far removed from any of our minds, uh, it would have never been possible. But this is not the 20th century anymore. This is the 21st century. And in my opinion, uh, it's going to belong to the apostolic church. It will. Because we have the promise of an 11th hour revival. And we have the promise of a latter rain. And I believe 
that what we have seen so far is nothing compared to what we're going to see. And I'll talk more about that in future times. But here's where I'm going with this. The divorce rates have doubled since 1960 to the point that the average m marriage in America is right now only lasting about seven years. Now, according to census report, 5% of couples currently married, only 5% will reach the golden anniversary of 50 years. Now, in fairness, there's other factors besides divorce, such as death and mortality, that factor into that, but still it's an alarming statistic. But the largest culprit is not mortality. The largest culprit, because we're living longer than we used to, but the largest culprit to it all is the prevalent idea of a divorce that has entered into our cultures. The bottom line is very few couples stick things out anymore over the long haul. It's, it's, not, it's not expected today like it was expected in times past. In our uh, quote-unquote enlightened society, uh, uh, many couples are not even making it past 10 years, and that's if they marry at all. According to Focus on the Family, all marriage trends are down in America. Bring up the next slide. This was uh, amazing to me. Uh, Marriage101.org gave some statistics that I, I want to put up here. And I want you to see this. The divorce rate in America right now for first marriages is as high as 41%. The divorce rate for second marriages is 60 percent and the divorce rate for third marriages is 73 percent so so much for the wisdom that said we need to live together first or we need to you know we married the wrong person first or we weren't mature enough first no the real reality is and I think one of the th things that bears this out is that once you have gotten over the hurdle, it's easier to do the second time. And once you've done it two times, it's no problem to do it the third time. And after you've done that, you're like the woman at the well. <laughs> She'd been through five and she's married with the next one. Or she's shacked up with the next one. I want to read you a, a brief little statement from this particular website because this is their analysis. It says the divor divorce rate in America is more than 50% that, that you come up with that when you average those together. And that means one in two couples will break up. The question is, why is it so high? What is the real reason for them to divorce? I think we should look for the answer from the American belief. Freedom is one of the most important beliefs for America, and nothing replaces it besides love. When they married... They don't run for long-term love. If they think that love and family can't offer their happiness and safety, they will choose to divorce. They wouldn't think more about the family or the children because then, than they do themselves because they take themselves as the center. That means they love freedom, not stability. Their dreams are running for, are running for their own this is their word, blessedness. I want, to, I want to say to us tonight, you cannot have a house called blessed with everybody in the house living for themselves and pressing for their own agenda. It's just not going to work. We are, as a culture, waiting longer to marry. The average age of a man in America is 29 to get married the first time for a woman, it's 25. And unfortunately, most of those, unless there's a Christian influence, they're not being faithful uh, sexually. They're immoral. And as a result, what this has done, according to the people who study this stuff, not like you needed a degree to figure this out, but young men tend to shy away from marriage and commitment. I'm thinking, well, anybody's ever been around young men know that's true. <laughs> and so they put together a list. The National Marriage Project came up with the top ten reasons 
young men won't commit. Number one, it's because nowadays they can get sex without marriage more easily than in times past. You know, that's an interesting thought, and, and, and that's a reality. As a matter of fact, it it's, it's also leads into number two. They can enjoy the benefits of having a wife by cohabitating rather than marrying. God made the sex drive in young men incredibly strong. Stronger than the ladies. But there was a reason that God did that. And, you know... God knew what, what he was doing in us. I'll tell you what I think. I think God designed the sex drive into young men to be so strong because it was supposed to drive young men toward maturity. Man up. It's time to take on a family, buy a home, get, get on with the program, you know, because... Not because I wanted all of that stuff so much now, but I wanted to be with a woman. <laughs> Number three, they want to avoid divorce and its financial risks. Number four, they want to wait until they're older to have children. Number five, they fear that marriage will require too many changes and compromises. It will. <laughs> That's part of the program. It's part of the maturity process. They're waiting for, uh, number six, they're waiting for the perfect soulmate, and they haven't come along yet. Well, you will grow old <laughs> and die of di diabetes or some other kind of aged thing <laughs> if you're looking for the perfect woman. And ladies, I might add, if you're looking for the perfect man, you're in the same boat. <laughs> Number seven, they face few social pressures to marry. That's true. They're, they're all but gone. Number eight, they're reluctant to marry a woman who's already had children. And the irony is, the longer you wait to get married, the more probable that is. <laughs> so if a young man doesn't want to get married to his 30 and then wants to complain because the woman has already had children... I mean, I've had this. I've had people tell me that, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, well, you know, did you not connect the dots on this like 10 years ago? <laughs> Number nine, they want to own a house before they get a wife. Number 10, and I think maybe this one really sums it up, they just want to enjoy the single life as long as they can. <laughs> now, that's what culture says. Let me read you what the scripture says. Proverbs 14, just one quick verse here. Wisdom resteth in the heart of him that hath understanding. But that which is in the midst of fools is made known. Righteousness exalteth a nation. But sin is a reproach to any people. The reason, the true root reason that we are extending marriage into the future as a culture I'm talking about is not because of education it's not because of buying houses it's not because of all that every generation has had all those same hurdles to deal with it is because we are as a culture speakingly or speaking as a culture we have unhooked our culture from biblical mores and the idea of sexual purity is no longer even a thought so what we have done is we have broken God's rules that he placed on the powerful thing called sexuality and not thinking about the consequences of what it was going to do to a culture. That's why I continue, despite all the modern things that we do. There's a lot of things I do that are very modern and cutting edge, but there's some things I choose to stay rooted to history on. And one of those, just a little peeve of mine, I guess, but I like to use those uh, Episcopal vows because there's something about it. If everything else in the ceremony is modernized, but there's something about those words and that challenge. It says, for better, for worse. For richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. You've heard me say it. The reason them old guys wrote that 
is because you will be tested in every one of them in the course of your house. And so if you're somehow thinking, I'm going to maneuver by and bypass all these things, you're not going to bypass marital drama because it goes along with life. But God is there to help us. And when God helps us through those things, the real amazing irony is, and, and I believe this is because marriage is a God-ordained thing. He designed it, you know. And, and I, it has a way, and you know, you know the scenario, the thing the police hate the most is showing up at a domestic dispute. Husband beating on the wife. Next thing you know, the officer's trying to arrest the husband and the wife's taking a frying pan to the police officer. <laughs> it's the craziest thing. And, and, and I, I've seen, you, you, you think they're mad at each other, but you try getting in between them. It, it's an amazing thing to observe. Jesus, however, wants to get in the middle. That's why he said so many times, you have heard, but I say unto you. You have heard, but I say unto you. Jesus was constantly challenging the social mores of his day, and the church has to challenge ours, because ours are even more cockeyed than they were. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And I have made this comment for some time. I'm going to say it again right now. What I have concluded is that most, not all, but most tests of marriage for us is really a test of our Christianity. It may be manifesting as a marital home problem, but at the root of it, it is our Christianity. We would lessen our marriage drama and problems if we could just act like we got the Holy Ghost, even if you haven't prayed through for a while, pretend. Be more civil. We need, we need more wisdom because some of us somehow think that getting married gives us some sort of a license to say things and address things that we would never do it that way with anybody else. I've had people in the church that, that are like, you know, we've had problems with them. They're just, you know, great people, but man, they're like bulls in a china cupboard, you know. And just, you know, some folks are just like, you know, sandpaper sometimes. They just, you know, they'll walk into a room and poof, you know, blow it. I, I tell people, so I, you know, if you all would treat each other the way you treat me, we wouldn't have a lot of trouble. Because most of you are afraid enough of me that you treat me right. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Or you love me so much. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> now, here's my point. You can get mad at me if you want, but if you have enough self-control to act right when you're talking with me about it, then that tells me you can do the same thing with your spouse or your children or your parents. ruh -roh. Let's go to Hebrews 13 for a minute. I don't even know where all I'm going with this, but I'm just really following after burden for a little bit. The writer of Hebrews opens up the 13th chapter and he says, verse 1, Let brotherly love continue, even after marriage. That's the pastor's footnote. <laughs> Some of you say, really? After marriage? I got to... <laughs> You do not cease being spiritual siblings once you take on the man and wife role. It just adds a dimension to it. But both of you are still a part of the household of God. And if we don't treat one another right, it is the same as he said it was mistreating the body. Be 
Be not forgetful to entertain strangers. In other words, treat everybody civilly and kindly. Stop snapping at everybody. Stop giving a piece of your mind. You cannot afford to keep giving away pieces of your mind. Thereby some, not everybody, some have entertained angels unawares. He's literally telling us, be careful how you treat even acquaintances and strangers that come by that you don't. Some of us have entertained the angels of the Lord and we, well, let's just say it was not our finest hour. Remember them that are in bonds, or in other words, prison, as if you were bound with them. And remember them which suffer adversity, being yourselves also in the body. In other words, empathy. The law of kindness. I, I, I just for the life of me don't understand why we eject the law of kindness just because we have an emotional flare-up of some sort. Now, I'm, I, I read all that to really get to verse 4. Marriage, everybody say marriage, is honorable in all. The Greek word there is timios. It means costly or valuable or something to be highly esteemed. Marriage is to be highly esteemed in all, or in other words, in every way. And the bed is undefiled. That means God views the marriage bed as a sexually pure place, as opposed to adultery or uh, fornication, etc. It's where God designed for things to happen. He made it that way. But whoremongers and adulterers, this is where you get the other side, God will judge. Now, the problem, and this is what I'm saying a lot of times, is we lack a fear of God. We, we just think God's not going to judge us if we do. But He doesn't always do it immediately. But there's a season. But if we do not repent, it will be dealt with. Let your conversation, this means your deportment, your behavior, your manners. In the original Greek, it meant more than how you talk. Let it be without covetousness. Now here's just something to underline. And be content with such things as you have, for he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now what he's saying is, he said, as long as you have Jesus, you, you may not have everything that you want in material things, but be content with what you have. As long as you have Jesus, everything's going to be okay. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. You know, the truth is, too many of us have more of a fear of man than we do of God. We're more afraid of what others think of us than we are of what God thinks of us. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of the Lord. This is talking about spiritual authority. Whose faith follow. Everybody say follow considering the end of their conversation, or in other words, their behavior. If they're not acting and behaving as, as a leader should, then they're disqualified to have to be followed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In other words, these are creational principles. This is not just something for one particular time. Now, I'm going to say something. I want you to go back with me to the book of Malachi, last book of the Old Testament. And I want you to go to the second chapter. Because I'm going to get I'm going to get pretty straight with us here for a little bit. Because my obligation as a minister and a pastor is to remind us of what God's position and thinking on issues is. Having said that, can I give you some basic 
reminders in second uh, Malachi 2.13. And this have you done again, co covering the altar of the Lord with tears and weeping and with crying out, insomuch as he regardeth not the offering any more, or receiveth it with good will at your hand. Now he's literally telling them, he said, you're coming to the altar, and you're, you're crying out, and you're begging me to do this. And that. He said, I'm ignoring it. He said, I am not receiving your offering. Yet you say, wherefore? Or in other words, why? Why? Am I crying out to you, Lord, and yet you're not hearing me? Why does things just continuously get worse? Now Malachi said it was because. Everybody say because. In their particular case, he looked at them as a nation. Again, there were obvious exceptions to this. But because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt, treacherously. Now that word in Hebrew means to cover or to act covertly or to pillage. It means deceitful, being deceitful or unfaithful. Yet she, and, and by the way, this works both ways. But I believe the Lord addressed it to the men because at this particular time in history there was more of a problem with men but also it goes back to creational order. God's coming to a household and he starts with what is supposed to be the head of the house whether they're acting like it or not. He said the, the, the problem is she is thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Everybody say covenant. And did she not, did he not make one, in other words make you one? Yet had not the residue of the Spirit, wherefore and wherefore one, that you might seek a godly seed? There's a, God brought it together. He put his blessing on it. Therefore, take heed to your what? That's not a capital S. That's a small s because it's referring to the human spirit. It's talking about our attitude, our demeanor. Our temper. <laughs> Still on. <laughs> Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. And again, this works both ways. For the Lord God of Israel saith that he hateth putting away. In other words, divorce. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit. Now, here's the second time that he says that the problem is in our unmanaged, uncontrolled spirits, human spirits. Be, be, take heed that you do not deal treacherously. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, where have we wearied him? When you say, every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord and delighteth him, and where is the God of judgment? And I might say that some of the words that we weary God with are not always the words that we're saying to him in our prayer time. Sometimes it's the words we're saying to each other in our day-to-day -day life. But because we're the body of Christ... He's receiving it unto him. Now I know that there are very many various reasons that people want to have for a divorce. And, but I, all my purpose tonight is I just want to remind us not to forget God's general reaction to it all. Now I personally believe that there is no marriage that cannot be repaired. Now having said that, I'm going to add the caveat, if the two people are willing to humble themselves before God. Now if one won't or both won't, it won't happen. But the lack of repair is not because the opportunity is not there. The lack of repair is due to the spirit. 
So in marriage, in your household, you have to take the long approach. When you go to the trouble of having a child, you have to change gears in your mind and understand what we just did is not a, 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 not a nine-month project. It's a 16, 17, 18-year project. And in some cases, a 20, 23, 4, 5-year project. <laughs> and in some real rough cases, well, never mind. <laughs> but you have to take the long approach. And there's going to be times in the raising of our children that it's going to be difficult and, and rough and, and rough stages and phases. And, 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 and if you're in the middle of any one of them that's bad, the, the idea is hit the eject button. But you don't do that because I've got a long-term view of this thing. I'm going to ride this mule till they're out the door. <laughs> I'm going to stay involved in this thing because I've made a commitment to that. That's the thinking that, that needs to be in us. God basically, and, and what I just read here, is basically saying, I am watching how you treat one another. I'm watching how husbands treat their wives. I'm watching how wives treat their husbands. And let me tell you something. When you're fussed up about something and you don't have your spirit under control, you can even assume that things are a lot worse than they really are. God has to judge it sometimes. All I'm saying is God said, I'm watching how you treat your family because he hates divorce. And two times, he says, take heed to your spirit. Keep your attitude under control. And I want to say, ladies, that applies just as much to you as it does to the, to the men. I figured that there'd at least be some male amens. <laughs> Yeah, they're afraid. <laughs> Bring up Matthew 19 a moment. Now I want to show you something. When Jesus was talking, and, and think about what we read, and then think about this. The Pharisees came to him also tempting him. You know, not everybody that comes to church is coming for the right reason. And saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Now, the every cause is, is what the issue was here. And we don't have time to, to delve into all this, but we will explore it deeper during this series somewhere. But this is where I'm wanting you to go. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read? You know, what he's saying is, It's already in the book. <laughs> Why are you asking me something that you should have already studied on your own? But then he quoted, he that made them at the beginning made them male and female. He's referring, he's quoting Genesis. Verse 5, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, question mark. He said, didn't you read that? Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. Everybody say one flesh. Mm -hmm. Now, and then he, and he said, what therefore God hath joined together, let no man... Put asunder. Now, if you got yourself in some marital difficulties, don't go run into this verse and say, See, God hates divorce. Get yourself together. That makes no sense if your own spirit is out of control. Because it probably wouldn't be an issue. Well, hallelujah. This one flesh doctrine noted that God's idea for marriage was to be lifelong. That was his goal. That was his desire. Realize it doesn't always work. But the question is, what did God put us on? I've had people literally say to me, in the older, well, God didn't put us together. I married the wrong person. I'm going to venture to say anybody that's been married for a while has thought that they married the wrong person at some point or another. <laughs> you realize how rookie that is? <laughs> because again, you're, 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 you're,
basing everything on the, the, the stage or a phase. And sometimes if you can be faithful and, and, and be patient. The Spirit of the Lord was speaking in my mind the other day about a situation where I said, be patient. Because the solution to this is not going to be an overnight thing, but there is a solution. But you'll never get to it if you have a short-term mindset. When Jesus said what God hath joined together, he was not necessarily talking about the individual circumstance, though the Lord certainly has been involved in leading many people to each other. I, I would also acknowledge that I don't think it's wise to necessarily blame God for misguided choices that were made against counsel or in some cases just immaturity of youth. Don't get into a trouble with your spouse and say, well, it's God's fault because he wanted me to be happy <laughs> and I'm not happy. And if I'm not happy and, that, and this is supposed to be God's will, that means it's God's fault. And then we start getting bitter at God towards something that the real root of the issues go back to us. So when, when God joined together, what God joined together was the institution of, of marriage, and he's saying men should not be tinkering with it. Such as our legislators have been doing the last number of years. Breaking the creational order and laws of God, and it has dire societal consequences that's why by the way in a lot of eastern cultures that are a lot older than American culture uh, parents would choose the spouse for their kids now I'm not arguing for that I doubt I would have been happy but young men are driven more sexually that more for sexuality than companionship it's the old saying good kissing don't last but good cooking do <laughs> but i will tell you this somebody that's very young never been married before and you let them make so all they're going to do is pay who are they in love with who are they in love with and that's bad when they're not even here to answer the phone <laughs> Young people are just looking around, who am I attracted to? Who am I in love with? Now, you, you let somebody who's been married a few decades do the choosing, and they're going to have a different criteria. They're going to look more for companionship. They're going to look more for con values that are the same and so forth, because they understand that the sexual issue is only one component. And if you put everything on that one component, or I might add, if you put everything on any one component, you're going to break it. Verse 7. So they say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement to put, away, put her away? Uh, so that's a, that's a legitimate question. Jesus is saying that it, it was never meant to be divorced. And he said, well, then why did Moses allow it? Verse 8, Moses allowed it because of the hardness of your hearts. Now again, this is the exact same complaint God had in Malachi when he said, take heed to your spirit. Because of the hardness of your hearts, suffering you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, going back to creational order, it was not so. Here's what it boils down to. What it boils down to is one or both individuals at some point refuse to submit themselves to God. They refuse to listen. They will not listen to the pulpit. They will not listen to any kind of counselor or authority. And, and, and by the way, I, I got I to gotta tell you, the statistics couples that make it after a long time bunches of counseling are not any better than those that didn't 
And I think the reason for that is sometimes what we do in counseling is we go in circles dealing with the peripheral issues. And we never get to the root issue, which is submission to God. And if you're in a non-biblical setting, you're not kind of even able to do that. And so you end up trying to modify behavior without modifying the human spirit or the heart. And so any gains are usually going to be very short-lived because all of us as people will tend at some point to revert back to our default settings until the Holy Ghost can do some things inside of us to change our settings. Verse 9, But I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. And again, I might add, this this works both ways. Whoa, I'm about out of time. <laughs> this works both ways. So here's something strong to end on. <laughs> Folks, you need to be very, very careful when you start considering the ramifications of divorce. There are reasons that you can separate or even get a divorce. Jesus cracked the door open slightly, but he didn't swing it wide open. But aside from that, the door that may not be open is the door of remarriage. And if I'm understanding the scripture, there are some second marriages that are considered nothing more in God's eyes than continued adultery. Now this gets complicated. Because I also realize that divorce most often, not always, but most of the time, it is a sin, or at least it involves sin. And God certainly hates it, but I also acknowledge it's not the, it's not the unforgivable sin. And every issue has to be dealt with. The intricacies of it have to be dealt with in, with pastoral leaders and, and trying to uh, pray and seek the Lord for the word as to what is the situation in this particular issue. But I marvel through the years uh, that people just get upset and usually it's because they're chasing happy. <laughs> and they're so convinced they're going to be happy with someone else. But because they haven't been reading a book, they haven't been listening to the pulpit, they haven't been paying attention to the things God's been saying, they end up chasing themselves into a rabbit trail that they can get in over their head awfully fast. And too many don't think it through because they're reacting to emotion rather than submitting to the counsel of the Word of God. Verse 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, <laughs> it's not good to marry. Yeah, hello. <laughs> you say, whoa, that's serious. But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying. Save to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs, these are, these are people that are decidedly single by choice, said, which were born so from their mother's womb. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, I misread. That's, that's where you may have some health issues or whatever. There are some eunuchs which have been made eunuchs of men. That's other people's circumstances. And then there be eunuchs which have been made, them, made themselves eunuchs. That, in other words, by decision. For the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. This is the condition that the Apostle Paul chose to stay in. And I'm going to take out my pen and mark where I stopped. <laughs> and we'll pick up in another session. Stand with me tonight. I'm not out of talking, but I'm out of time. <laughs> I want you to lift your hands unto the Lord just one more time real quick. Would you just pray for our homes and our marriages and our households? Dear Jesus, 
We're living in a time of great spiritual intensity. In so many homes, marriages and families are under attack. Lord, I don't have the answer to all these things. But I know you have an answer to everything. And I'm asking you to move on the households and families of this church. We want to live in a house called blessed. We want to submit ourselves. And we're going to be patient. And we're going to gear our minds to the long haul. And believe you for victories in our homes in the name of Jesus. Now, in closing, would you clap your hands and shout unto the Lord a voice of praise. One more time. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. God bless you. You're dismissed tonight in the name of the Lord. Thank you for being faithful to the house of the Lord. Leaders, we'll see you.